morning. It's a real honor to have Lou Monter, CEO of Mattel, um, which is a powerhouse in technology and science discovery, R&D, really. Um, Mattel's been involved for 90 years in a whole bunch of very strategic national um, areas, nuclear research, national security. I I'll let Lou talk a little bit more about that. Now they're focused on security, healthcare, and large research infrastructure. So Lou, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know it's an intense period for, for you, but thank you for taking the time and fill in the blanks on Battelle and about your background. All right, Benny. Well, thanks for having me today. It's uh, so nice to be here. Uh, I always get excited when I get to talk about the company. Um, you know, Battelle uh, started actually 90 years ago, as you said. Uh, we, we came about from an industrialist here in the Midwest that had uh, metallurgy plants, uh, largely doing castings and things like that back in the day. And uh, he had trouble getting help whenever they had uh, problems, whenever they had scientific problems. So he left in his will um, much of his wealth to basically set up a nonprofit institute that would help solve. And it's, it's worded very interesting. I actually have a coin on my desk that um, basically take innovation and in science to apply to society, to improve society. And, um, and that's what the company has done now for 90 years. A lot of people don't know about us, but uh, Battelle's the company that it helped invent the Xerox machine, the CD-ROM, the bar scanner, you know, all the way down to things that nobody would ever think of, like the uh, hard candy coatings that go over chocolate <laughs> years ago. And if you're a golfer like I am, the uh, Serlin cover for a golf ball that keeps a golf ball from cutting. And I remember I'm um, aging myself, but in my young days as a kid when I first got to pick up my dad's clubs for the first time. Every time you miss hit a ball, you'd put a big smile in it where we'd make a deep cut and that doesn't happen anymore. So uh, all these places that you wouldn't expect, uh, Battelle's been in over the years. And when you look at us more modernly, uh, the company is doing, uh, we run a lot of our nation's uh, research infrastructure. So uh, for the National Science Foundation, uh, we base built and are now running their largest ecological system, a program called NEON that's got sites all over um, U.S. territories, and it's basically going to build a 30-year track of how our environment's changing down at a very detailed level from actual samples of, uh, of bugs and things in the environment to very sophisticated uh, measures of humidity and loss, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, we were the first to reanimate a paraplegic. Uh, we put a sensor in a paraplegic's head, a young man, a very brave young man who had had an accident, and um, we can basically read his brain um, waves now and we can interpret his thoughts and um, transition those down via a computer down to a sleeve on his arm and he can control his arm again oh, wow. uh, he can drink a cup of coffee he can play a wee guitar it's uh it's given him uh more meaning and, and more capability and we're still in the research stage but we've now actually built um you know he could think and he could learn how to control things again to pick up a cup um, but now we've actually, but he couldn't feel, right? He couldn't feel when he'd move his arm, like when he should stop. Well, now we've actually gone back and we can take sensors off the activities he's doing and feed information back into his brain. And he senses now that he's actually feeling the physical movement that gets him better control. We recently won a research contract with the government. And we're in the very early stages of trying to do this without having, today we've put a little sensor in his head through, uh, through surgery. And we're trying to invent ways we can do it without the sensor, without having to have the surgery for that sensor. Um, again, very futuristic things. Uh, we also play in areas like the environment. Uh, there's these forever chemicals. If you saw the movie Dark Waters uh, that became popular recently, there's these things called PFOSs and PFASs that are called uh, forever chemicals because they're the strongest bond known in nature. And that makes them wonderful for industrial things like nonstick cookware and waterproofing on your rain jacket. But the problem is because they're such strong bonds, they never break down. So we are, uh, in, we are researching and inventing a number of technologies to both identify, uh, figure out where they came from uh, when the government tries to work the accountability side of how we will clean these up because we are finding them to be carcinogens and the EPA appears to be on that track. And then we've actually recently invented a technology that we're uh, just in the demonstration phase now that can actually destroy them. Um, so if we can go on a site, uh, congregate them into a... Uh, into a smaller area, we can actually have a technology that we believe we'll be able to put in the field that can destroy them. So lots of interesting things going on in the company today and in a lot of areas. Uh, me personally, I, I was the first in my family to go to college. Uh, 
uh, got an engineering degree because I had a physics uh, teacher in high school that said I was good at math. I should go into engineering. I never really met an engineer in my life before, uh, but it was fun. I, I got to go to Bell Labs early in my career, which was a candy store for a young engineer. It was uh, really remarkable back in those days. Uh, you know, company went 100 years with more than a patent a day. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't really exist in that form today. Uh, things have changed over time. But um, for me, I got to do that for a long time. And then um, General Dynamics bought the defense part of, of um, Bell Laboratories. And uh, Bell Labs taught me engineering and program management. And GD came in and really taught me business. And so I've done a, I spent 30 years at that first career. And then I've done a few things since then. And Patel's my second CEO job. Um, been here about three years now, really loving it. And for me, it's like coming home again. It's like coming back to that Bell Labs environment. But now I'm a little smarter, and I can actually try to bring a business model into it to, to make sure the company lasts forever. Uh, you know, Lou, what a fascinating career. And it's so nice to have somebody with so much. You know, you've covered biotech. You've covered a whole bunch of disciplines just in the last couple of minutes, right? So this is going to be a really fascinating conversation. Uh, Lou, I think I heard about Patel. I know about Patel through Patrick and others, but I heard about you when it was the end of March. You know, huge shortage of PPEs, and I heard President Trump say that we may have come across something that can help decom decontaminate these masks and extend their lives. In effect, reduce some of the capacity shortages. Turned out to be what you have done with hydrogen peroxide. Why don't you describe a little bit about how what heroics it must have taken you to bring it out to market probably quicker than you expected and how you're helping hospitals extend the life of their N95s. Yeah, no, uh, thanks, Vinny. It, it, this is a great story because it's, it's exactly the kind of things of why somebody comes to work at Patel. You know, we're a nonprofit. I, I can't give you stock options. So you come there to do good work, uh, get paid, paid a fair salary, but have a mission, be able to always be on the right side of every issue. And um, interestingly, I didn't even know about this, but about three years ago, we had done a study um, for the CDC. They had actually worried during the last Ebola outbreak, um, they actually worried that if an outbreak like that happened in the United States, would we run out of these N95 masks? And these are the masks that, um, that have higher filtration, uh, that can actually uh, protect you and, and the person next to you um, from airborne pathogens like a coronavirus. So we had done this very thorough two-year study we knew that uh, vaporized hydrogen peroxide um, could kill coronavirus and lots of other things. We knew it was safe and we had done the research to show that we could actually do it 30, 40 times before the mass would break down. Um, so we put in a report and said, you know, you could do this 20 times very safely. And then we went on our way and everybody kind of forgot about it. So as in the early days of the pandemic, and if you think back, um, the social distancing, the shutdowns we did um, really did work pretty well and they were horrific on our economy uh, and very difficult, but we saw the caseloads drop rapidly in many cities and we've seen other countries that haven't been able to do this. We've seen um, quickly how their hospitals can get overwhelmed and how the death rates increase as those hospitals get overwhelmed. So we had a young couple, one of my engineers who was part of that study, his wife worked at one of our local hospitals, Ohio Health. And she was starting to talk about, they were already, uh, this is before we even got to shutdowns, they were already running out of these N95 masks. And um, he knew we had done this study. So he actually shot a note up through the management chain. Um, I had just met with our team a couple days earlier. Uh, we, once we saw the um, virus get to Singapore and the number of cases growing, uh, we kind of assumed it was coming here. There was really no way to stop it. Uh, so I told my team, what are we going to do to fix this? What are we going to do to help? Don't worry about money. We'll figure it out later. So we had our team kind of thinking about ideas, and this idea came up. And so we very quickly put a team together, and we actually built uh, a mechanism to scale this from doing a couple masks to being able to do up to 80,000 a day out of a single system. And we did it in nine days. People wow. literally worked 24 hours a day. Uh, they built these big uh, ISO bands that you see on the road uh, and you can in racks and, and shelves, and you can put these masks up. We worked on a process to um, tag every mask uh, so you can keep track of them. Uh, we worked with our partners at Ohio Health, um, who was the hospital that my engineer's wife was from, and they helped us understand how hospitals, the logistics would work, and how to actually do this. And within a few days after proving that in, we were actually able to get the emergency authorization from the FDA, and there, there was a few, little bit of press and some politics around the speed of that. If you remember, because at that time, 
uh, we were all going very exponential in the number of cases. It was, it was just before the shutdown. And, uh, you know, it, we actually thought and, and FEMA thought we would be seeing millions and millions of masks needing to be cleaned every day and we were going to be short by billions. Um, the shutdown actually helped. We didn't see the, the cases rise to those levels. But we were able to, with the help of the government, we got a contract to actually build 60 of these systems. And each system is eight full tractor trailer containers, four of them that the masks go into and four more for logistics and showers and protective gear for our folks. We were able to put those, um, uh, deploy those through the Defense Logistics Organization into most of the states of this country. We put 49 systems out and they had 11 extra systems that we have on standby for hotspots. And those have been out running now for a number of months. We've, uh, in the next week or two, we'll clean our 2000th mask. Um, it's worked really well. Since that time, we had the initial studies. Um, NIOSH, who is the uh, organization that sets the standard for these masks, has actually been able to take masks that we've cleaned 20 times and, and uh, we've proved that they work and the masks aren't harmed. Uh, 3M, who is the maker, one of the major makers of the mask, um, has also done that and we've been able to um, cycle masks for them and they've taken masks. We've also worked with uh, Massachusetts General up in that area through masks that have been through five to up to I think 10 cycles. And uh, we've been able to continue to prove in the technology. What I'm most proud of is um, for me, this was personal. I've got a daughter who's a doctor and a niece who's a nurse. And when this all started, my daughter's hospital was giving her one mask a week and they were putting surgical masks over top of it. Uh, we saw other hospitals that were giving doctors one mask a week and they were telling them to put them on their car dashboard overnight and hope that that would do it. So, you know, lots of home remedies and grandma's remedies out of necessity. And what I think we found, we've got 20,000 locations or 23,000 locations, I think, in the country signed up that are using this down to um, nursing homes to first responders to big hospital systems and everything from some people send us 10 masks, some people send us thousands a day. Uh, I, this is anecdotal, but I, I think every system we're working with has gotten back to at least having one clean mask per day for their, um, for their doctors and their clinicians and nurses again. Uh, so I think it really has made a difference. It's a stopgap solution, uh, sure. but, I, but I'm proud of the team and I'm proud of how quickly they responded. You know, we also uh, took 300 of our people. We stopped a lot of the work we were doing and, and those people did some quick training because they already knew how to deal with biohazards and they deployed all over this country, including some of the most dangerous places in the country. They volunteered. We've hired another uh, 700 people since then uh, that have gone out and been trained in our facilities here in Ohio and then gone out and done these, done this mass cleanings. And it's, it's gone really well. Um, I couldn't be prouder of the team. So, so Lou, um, you know, like I say, it's stopgap. 3M has quadrupled its capacity. Honeywell, similar. Others have jumped into the PPE market. What does that mean for you? Does that mean a bigger market? Or because more new masks are going to be available, people aren't going to use you as much? Have yeah, you we, we don't see this as long-term business. Um, and this isn't the type of business Patel would typically do. We would typically invent something like this and hand off to somebody else to kind of do the, the, the management, the operations, and, and the day-to-day -day lower end pieces of it. But now we would like to see the nurses and everybody getting a, a fresh mask with every patient like they used to again. And I think um, Honeywell, 3M and others are, are, are gearing up dramatically, but the um, projections I'm seeing from the government now is sometime the end of this calendar year through probably uh, early next year, depending on what happens to the cases, uh, is when they're probably gonna actually get caught up to where we'll have those. So we probably have another three to six to nine months of this. Um, once this is done, these systems will go into our national stockpile and they'll be available uh, should we have another pandemic or another reason where this needs to happen and, and we'll have this available for the country. So let be able to happen even quicker next time. What a, what a great story. Now, look, Patel is used to very complex projects, right? Yeah. Probably not this intensity though. So tell us about a little more, right? I'm sure you're doing other stuff with the coronavirus. Tell us what you can tell publicly. And then sure. compared, compared to the, the intensity of the last four months to your normal projects. Yeah, so I can start with that. You know, uh, personally, I've always worked kind of hard. It's, it's in the work ethic I was taught growing up. So, I, you know, I probably averaged 60 hours a week for my career since the time I was 20 something. Um, you know, I was doing 100 hour weeks for the, you know, 80 to 100 hour weeks for the first uh, month of this. And so was everybody else. Right. I mean, we had 11 o'clock calls with the governor, the literally the head of the FDA uh, was helping to get these approvals through uh, the government really came together. 
to try to get these things done. And everybody uh, from FDA through our folks, engineers who are literally working around the clock, uh, not a lot of sleep. The intensity, because it matters, right? Because uh, people's lives were at stake and, and our country needed the help. And we didn't have to ask our people to do this. Um, this was just needed and our people stepped up to do it. Um, so along with this program, we've also developed a number of different COVID tests. Um, we developed a test that uses a slightly different reagent, so it ties into a slightly different supply chain. Uh, we've taken that test, uh, put it in, uh, took a lot of our equipment, moved it into the hospital at Ohio State and have partnered with them in their clinical lab uh, and have been running those tests now for the past six weeks. Uh, we're working on some other types of uh, tests like spit tests, uh, you know, and not all the pro projects work. We probably started a dozen projects. We actually built in a week a um, ventilator that would cost less than $400. Whoa. And so, you know, again, our, our teams were excited. Now, uh, we didn't know anything about ventilators and we actually got to people. Uh, we learned the coronavirus is interesting. You, you can't have a ventilator that just uses a constant pressure. It needs to be able to adjust because this virus uh, uh, does things to the lungs that we're still trying to understand. So, you know, that one turned out to go back on the shelf, but when we had a few of those, um, one of the things we're really excited about is we have a sensor that can actually detect coronavirus in the air. Now we're really struggling to figure out how to use it practically. And um, we have people still working around the clock to try to figure that out. Hopefully we'll come up with practical uses for it because the, the, we can definitely detect it in a room. The problem is if you get one molecule, what does that mean? Do you shut it down or not? Uh, how do you tell? Um, we think we can tell it differently from influenza A and influenza B in a room so you can figure out what you're dealing with, but still a lot of work to do. Um, it's not only good to have the technology, but one of the things Battelle's really good at is making these things work and be real in the real world. So we're, we're still looking at ways to continue that research because potentially if it ultimately worked, you could put it in airplanes, you could put it in, in meeting rooms and things like that, uh, but we're not there yet. That's still in the R&D stage. But again, I think the intensity has been amazing uh, and I, I give so much credit to our team. Um, they've all found a way to help and, and they, they can't do enough. Lou, you know, listening to you talk about the potential, right? I get goosebumps just listening to you, the potential. But, you know, it's been amazing, right? If you look at the last four months as an optimist, as I, I tend to look at the other side of things, you look at it, it's gone from zero to 50 million tests in four months our hospitals have learned exponentially, right? We're not overventilating, like you say, we've learned to do, expand ICU capacity in a matter of days. We have therapies like, um, you know, rem, remdesivir seem to have significant impact in ac acute cases. We've learned to parachute medical professionals across state lines. I mean, it's just amazing what all this stuff that has been going on, and yet, it just seems like, at least in the media, it's all doom and gloom. We haven't celebrated any of this amazing level of innovation and energy. How, how would you change the narrative? Well, yeah, I, I think, well, reading the newspapers in general tends to be depressing <laughs> these days. I think that's just kind of a national phenomenon where we find ourselves. You know, I think if you get past the politics and you get past the statements, um, we have made amazing strides. It's disappointing that we're seeing surges back in the country uh, where most of the um, rich countries like us around the uh, world have gotten a better control over this. You know, I think part of that goes with our freedoms and the independence and what we have in this country. I think it's also important for people to understand the predominant strain of the virus that's going around the United States is the one that came from Europe and Italy. It's much more contagious than the ones that started um, back in Asia. And, uh, and it, it's that much harder. But I do think, um, I think the narrative's twofold. One is, and I think we're finally getting consistent on this, is mass and protection and distancing really does work. It's not perfect, but, but again, we're playing a game of statistics here and it really does work. And the more we can consistently um, get across to people to be uh, aware of that and, and be dutiful in that, not just for themselves, but, but for their community, you know, I've always thought here in um, Columbus, Ohio, the Buckeyes are a big part of all of our lives. Um, I'm honored to be a trustee there. Uh, you know, if we would have said wear a mask, we might not get football this fall. I think we would have had a different output <laughs> than um, <laughs> the way we approach some of these things. But we've made amazing strides. Um, you know, the, the, what we did with our mask system, that would have normally taken years to get through. And with help from Congress, with help from the White House, our local uh, 
our, our local uh, health officials and others, we got that through in a safe way very quickly and it was able to get out much faster. Um, we're working with about a dozen of the vaccine companies now. Some of those are looking really good. Uh, we do some of the um, efficacy and safety parts of that work. Uh, and I think the, um, the warp speed program the government's doing right now to, you know, who cares if we try five of these that don't work? If one of them do, if you look at the overall impact of our economies of what this is causing worldwide, not just here in the U.S., uh, one success very quickly pays for hundreds of failures. So I think a lot of great things are happening. And the ingenuity coming out of American industry, universities, and the spirit of our country for the people that are doing things uh, has been remarkable. I mean, we've seen car companies switch over to making ventilators. We've seen companies switch over from making parachutes to masks uh, in, in very little time. The distillery is making hand sanitizer. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. We, we, we saw, um, you know, supply chains fell completely apart and people had to start from scratch, but people just didn't sit around and feel sorry for themselves. They, they've stepped up in so many ways. And, uh, you know, I think the testing is miraculous. Uh, we've gone from totally broken supply chains to we can do a lot now. Now we're going to need to do a lot more if we're really going to get these numbers down smaller and track and trace. And I still think in the end, we're either going to need a therapy that actually works on a high probability of cases and before you're sick enough to go into the intensive care unit, uh, and then ultimately a vaccine. And I think the vaccine is probably what eventually gets us back to um, whatever normal is in today's definition. But um, I know I look forward to that day uh, being able to travel again and do vacations. And I know everybody else does too, but hopefully we can get everybody to stay, uh, keep their masks on and be courteous of each other while we're in the interim phase. So Lou, let's switch gears a little bit. So I live in Florida, and I've written case studies about the National Hurricane Center, right? And they're a very modest organization considering how much impact they have. Because I kept saying, guys, have you quantified how much money you've saved the country? And they go, no, we, don't, we save lives. We don't worry about money, kind of like you, right? But the amount of lives they've, uh, of money they've saved, because we don't evacuate more than a couple of hundred miles of coastline, when a hurricane approaches. You know, their cone of uncertainty has gotten smaller and smaller, right. which means fewer people evacuated. I compare that to our pandemic modeling. And it's been, like you say, you know, it's been so chaotic. We shut the whole economy down. Yeah. Do you see us getting to a stage, if you have another issue like this, where we can say, let's lock down this zip code, this zip code, this, this zip code, or maybe this industry and this industry but not everything. It's yeah, I, like I do. I, I do, because if you look at the modeling that's happening now, you see the Johns Hopkins data that's now become everybody's Bible. I know I look at it every morning. Um, you look at modeling coming out of the universities. Uh, we, you know, we're looking at go back to school plans here at Ohio State, and, and um, faculty have been able to model uh, what they think might happen based upon zip codes of students. So, so I think just like for the first hurricanes, we couldn't do the kind of accuracy um, that we can do now after seeing hurricanes for years and our modeling getting more sophisticated. I think we'll see it happen here much quicker, but luckily we haven't had that many pandemics. Um, but I do think, you know, the secret to these things is always catch them when they're really small. Exponential growth happening at rapid phases, especially when people that are asymptomatic can pass it on, is, is everybody's nightmare. Right, that's where, and you've, you've seen the, you've read the stories and cases of a single individual in South Korea going out the first night the bars open and infecting 52 people. That person had no symptoms. They didn't know they were, but, but again, they weren't following the rules. They weren't being guidance. So I, I think this system, we're gonna come out with better measures and metrics. We'll come out with better ways to tie into our hospitals to see these things happening. Do you think and, you have to um, more in public health? I mean, is that an area where we'll need to it seems like the public health doesn't seem to have the statistical capability or even it just doesn't I, seem very organized. Yeah, I, I think without a doubt, most of the systems run pretty independently. They do work with each other, but it's in a loose fashion. I also think the government has a role to play. And um, we've watched, you know, these pandemics and things, we've prophesized these things happening. We've seen them happen in other countries for years. Um, but it's difficult when you're making all the trade-offs of budget deficits and spending and politics. Uh, it's one of the areas that hasn't caught a lot of that investment over the last five or six years. And at least for a time, I suspect that's going to change after this. Because I do think there are things we can do um, to protect the borders, protect our world. And if you find these things early, you have a much better chance of controlling them and keeping them 
from getting out of hand. And, and look at something like Ebola, where we've seen um, you know a dozen outbreaks over the last decades. We've gotten pretty good at that one, right? We um, some of the poor nations struggle with this, but we've been able to isolate it for the most part. We've been able to keep it out um, out of other places and, and bring aid into those places where it's found. So I, I, I would suspect we will um, see capabilities like that develop around these types of um, breakouts where the asymptomatic part makes it so much more difficult. Oh, it's so so nice to listen, listen to somebody who thought of it as you. Um, Lou, let's talk about leadership a little bit. You know, you're clearly, you're used to dealing with a lot of techies, STEM, STEM professionals, and in your career, you had a lot of military disciplines, right? You've dealt with a lot of defense um, companies. But this crisis, <clears throat> It's not logical, right? It's been a very emotional crisis. What have you drawn on to lead? Is it your family? Is it your faith? Is it friends? Is it mentors? How have you stayed positive? Yeah, well, I think for me personally, um, you know, I've had the chance. I, I went into management fairly young in my career, so I've been doing it for a long time now. This is my second CEO job, and I've had, you know, multi-billion dollar P&Ls for 20 years now under my responsibility. So, so for those who have been around for a while, you haven't had to deal with this, but, but stuff always happens. You know, uh, CEOs never get brought a good uh, a choice between good two choices. Those always get made at the low levels. You're always being asked to choose between the bad choices. And those are the things you do as a leader. And, and clearly, I think what's happening now is unprecedented. And we've seen, you know, so many, everything from the pandemic to the economic impact to, to the social injustice and those issues that were uh, that are all first in our mind today and so important. Uh, I think it's an extraordinarily challenging time to be a leader. And for me, uh, you know, we've been working culture in my organization. We we were lucky. We had a three-year head start since I got there, and, and we've got a miraculous team. And I've leaned on that team. Um, that team has stepped up. We get together, uh, you know, face to face in video when we can't be together uh, every week. We we talk uh, constantly, and we communicate, uh, over communicate with our people. And for me, that's been what's kept us together. I'm here on the home front. Uh, I usually travel about half the time. I get to spend more time with my lovely bride. I think she's getting a tad sick of me, but it's been nice to have more dinners at home. And, uh, and you know, in, in some ways you can be a little more efficient because you're not spending as much time on the road. Personally, I think for leadership though, uh, this is a very inefficient way to do work. And I think most of us look forward to getting back to looking people in the eyes. Uh, but again, uh, I've seen more companies succeed in this and fail so far. And it's because their leaders have risen to the occasion. They've um, and they put the safety of their employees first. And I think as long as, as long as you put the safety of your employees and society first, you usually can work everything else out. Uh, it's when those pieces start to break down is when you have problems. Great perspective. And you know, I, I've, I've traveled all my life, so I'm not exactly what you're saying. Yeah. I've been. I don't think this is the, this is the longest I've ever been grounded. Um, it certainly so. is for me. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, like you say, the same here. I, I spend more time with my lovely bride, and she can't wait for me to get out of the house, too. <laughs> now, let's change gears once again. Put on your economist hat. Okay. You know, you're on several boards, academic and corporate. How are you seeing the – how are you hearing about other CEOs and other boards that are seeing the economy? You see a sharp rebound. You see a gradual U rebound. You see a W up and down, flare ups, you know, global inconsistencies, or do you see an L? You know, we're going to be, you know, it's very, very slow, almost dead recovery for a while. Yeah, so, so you know, I'm not an economist, but but I do get a perception from these folks. So you have to take my opinion with a grain of salt because it's just that my opinion. Um, I think the jury's out, and I think it's very different sector by sector. You know, these organizations that have focused on um, Disconnecting from physical locations, uh, being able to buy things from your house. Uh, I, I think their business models are accelerating and are going to forever accelerate. And you're seeing a lot of those companies benefit and you're seeing the stock market show that. Uh, I think for companies that are in vacation travel and airlines and those places, I think this is going to look like an L for a while until we get closer to a vaccine, especially if we keep seeing blip ups. I mean, we're not even to phase two yet. We're still in you know, we're still in our first cycle of this. Um, 
But I think for most organizations, I kind of think of the Nike swoosh version of this, except the swoosh part, I think is going to have its ups and downs along the way. I don't think it's going to be a straight line. And I think it's really going to relate back to how, how much we can have the economy open at any one time. And that's going to depend on how many cases are in particular locations, particular factories. And again, it comes back to if, if we can be disciplined enough to manage the cases, to keep them down, you know, so we're level one or level two in our cities and in our areas instead of level three or level four, then I think we'll see a fairly robust economy. I think a lot of what the government's done has put a lot of money in people's pockets. I think uh, savings rates are at all time highs. And I think people are dying to spend some of that money, but I think most people are smart. And they're also hanging on a lot of that money until the future is a little bit clearer. And it's clear we don't have our arms around this virus yet uh, in this country. Um, I'm very hopeful. I started being pretty pessimistic on a vaccine because the, the fastest one we've ever done in the world was six years. They normally take 10 or 11 years. Uh, you know, one of the things Battelle does is we help with the flu shots every year with CDC and, and we work with a lot of companies that do vaccines for their safety and FDA approvals. And um, I started out pretty skeptical, but I'm much more optimistic watching a lot of these companies get through their early trials that you know, I think by the end of this calendar year, we could have vaccines rolling out. And it'll, it'll realistically take some time for those to get out. But I think as soon as we get a vaccine, we'll see a lot of the economic indicators because confidence will start to come back. And then I think it'll take time for actual spending to catch up when, um, you know, people are actually vaccinated and we kind of get to that herd immunity standpoint. And if, if for some reason we don't get the vaccine or we find something doesn't work, uh, I think that'll be a pretty dark day for some time. But this country, you know, we always... We'll always find a way to get through it. We're strong together. Uh, I like to think of us as we're not, we're not a great country when it comes to planning, but we, we do stand together when it comes time to react when there's a real, a real serious threat, and we do come together as Americans. Pat, you know, that's a great perspective about planning versus reacting. Um, you know, it's been really positive to see the government, right? I, I remember President Trump basically said, uh, HIPAA, forget it and uh, Medicare, you will accept telemedicine. Overnight, telemedicine took off in the last few months. So, and accelerated FDA, accelerated clinical trials and so on. So yeah, uh, all, all very positive. Lou, any final thoughts? I'd just like to thank you for having me today. I love to tell Battelle's story. It's got a long history and, and I get to stand on the shoulder of uh, you know 10 other CEOs that came before me and continue the tradition, but uh, you know, I think uh, we're just having fun um, being part of what's going on in the country and having a positive impact. And my last thing would just be once again to thank all of the engineer scientists and, and folks at the company for uh, for not only what they do every day, but for hanging tough uh, during all the challenges that have been offered here and and all the you know trying to do this while your while your kids are hanging around and you're, you're teaching school at home and everything else. And um, you know, the company really hasn't missed a beat yet. And I. I continue to be amazed by that, and that points to our people. So um, thanks for giving us the chance to hear our story. Lou, you used the word fun, and that's a great attitude to have in this time. So thank you again. It's been a pleasure, Vinny. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.